Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics and on this episode I'm going to talk about what do we mean when we talk about soundproofing or what is soundproofing. So let's get into a more technical definition which will help because that term itself is controversial. Technically, soundproof would imply that something cannot allow sound through at all. Now I, I would make an argument that the use of the term as it's used colloquially is actually okay Bulletproof, for instance, doesn't mean it can stop any bullet of any caliber at any distance. It simply means it's a term that gets used to describe something which can resist bullets of a certain caliber at a certain distance. So soundproofing is kind of the same thing. I mean, if we define sound not getting through as not necessarily 100% of the energy being absorbed or reflected back, but rather that its energy level has been reduced as it transfers through the wall by such a large amount that it's not audible, then when we mitigate sound or isolate sound in a room, we have effectively soundproofed it. So it's not a terrible term, but it's not a technical term and it's not what's typically used by engineers in the industry. We, we typically would talk about sound mitigation or sound isolation. Now, one of the things that happens quite a bit is that that term gets confused. So when I use that term, I sometimes have people email me and say, um, I'm really interested in reducing the sound levels in my room. What kinds of panels do I need on the wall? Well, the panels we put on walls doesn't stop sound from transferring through the walls. Um, it, it really only stops the sound or really reduces the sound that's reflecting off the walls. That's acoustic treatment that's different. That's something that's done to improve the sound quality. We don't do that to stop sound from, from traversing through the wall, if you will. Now, one of the confusing things about that is that as sound travels through a wall and it hits an absorber, a portion of that sound energy does actually get converted to heat. One of the whole reasons why sound is reduced in level when it hits a absorber and reflects off the wall is, is exactly that, that those fibers essentially convert the sound energy as they rub together into heat and that energy is now lost. So remember, conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change form. Sound energy is a kind of vibrational energy. If you convert that, we can't destroy the energy. So if we need to get rid of sound energy, well, then we need to convert it to something else that's benign. Heat is what we typically convert it to. So sound hits a wall, a portion, not all, a portion of that energy reflects off the wall. If we put an absorber there, it's going to absorb some of that sound energy and it will reduce the amplitude or the volume level of that sound reflection. That is different though from then the other portion of sound that travels through the wall. So when we talk about soundproofing, what we're talking about is reducing the sound energy that travels through the wall to the other side. In, a, in very simple terms, it's just the idea of making it so that on either side of that wall, less sound is getting through, less sound energy is getting through, it's quieter. Now there's two reasons to sound isolate a room. One of those reasons, um, which was my impetus originally, so I really didn't worry too much about the second reason, which is the noise level of the room in which I'm watching movies, so making the theater quieter. What I worried about was waking the kids. So my original theater that I had with my wife when, once we had kids was actually in an extra bedroom that was all, essentially right next to my daughter's room. So my daughter had a room, there was a closet, and then there was my room, my theater room. It was a, I think, 10 by 12 room, so it was not a big room. I had, essentially I did all the wrong things because I had no choice, just like many of you. I stuck the couch practically on the wall. I treated it, so the whole back wall had about four to six inches of absorption, and that was roughly the distance that the couch was from the wall. Um, or th it was theater chairs, actually, and that was all I could do. I mean, maybe it was a foot from the wall, but it wasn't great because, again, the room was only 12 feet. 100-inch screen, speakers on the wall, and the only thing that acted as a buffer between that room and my daughter's room was a closet. The walls weren't insulated. It was cheap, you know, it was, it was a track home, so it was just cheap construction. That closet will actually provide some decent buffer, so you do get a lot more sound isolation from a closet, especially if it's filled with stuff. 
um, uh, th than if there's no closet because you're essentially creating another wall with an air gap and that helps. But for the sake of argument, there was no sound isolation and bass just went right through the room. You could hear it in the other room and she was just a newborn and it could wake her up. So I couldn't watch movies very loud without waking her up. It also traveled through the whole rest of the house. My wife could hear it. And so she worked in the evenings and she couldn't easily work in the evenings with all that going on. So she used to complain and we had made a decision to uh, finish the basement, which was unfinished. And we wanted it for a few reasons. One was we really didn't have a playroom and we wanted the kids to have a place to go play. Um, we had been talking about finishing the basement since the day we moved in. We just couldn't afford it at the time. And she said, you know, when you looked at the shape, it was like an L-shaped basement, basically. And when you looked at the shape of it, there was like, it would have made kind of for a weird playroom if the whole thing was just this big open finished space. So she said, what if we close off this section? You can have that as your theater. And I uh, had studied sound isolation a bit in school. I knew the concepts from an engineering standpoint. I had certainly read all the forum posts and all the websites as well uh, for people who do it to kind of know what's the tech that people are using. But I didn't know a, a lot more than that. What I knew was I wanted to create a space where I could watch movies as loud as I wanted or music as loud as I wanted and it wouldn't bother anybody. And uh, I knew that conceptually you cannot soundproof a space. In other words, I knew that I couldn't stop 100% of the sound, but my hope was I could stop enough of the sound that it wouldn't be noticeable at reference or close to reference levels. And so my impetus for soundproofing was to allow that, was to basically keep me from bothering other people. Noise floor wasn't something I worried that much about because I was so used to normal ambient noise levels, it never really occurred to me that if I could get those noise levels down, the room itself would actually improve the dynamic range of the system and that it would be more enjoyable. Um, as is always the case, when you improve one thing, you often highlight faults in another thing. And noise is, is one of those things where fixing one thing can highlight a problem in a more extreme way, in part because some of those noises are uh, masking the problem. So I built this soundproof room. Uh, to give you an idea, I had figured out how to measure sound isolation using this new technique that basically involves measuring the impulse response of a speaker um, on one room where the speaker is and on the other side of that wall. Um, so the speaker stays where it is, but the microphone moves from one side of the wall to the other. You take in, in theory, two impulse responses. In practice, you do more than that, but let's just say in theory, you do two impulse responses. You take the difference between the two, which is by dividing one into the other, and it gives you what's called the transfer function of the wall itself, which is also the transmission loss. I did that, and then there's a way to convert all that to STC, so you can figure out the points loss that you actually have accounting for the RT60 of the rooms. I did that, and it came up with a number that was really good. It was like X STC 67 or 68. I figured out there actually were some problems, fixed those, eventually got up to like 72 or something. I mean, the wall was almost two feet thick. I think it was 18 inches. I think there was an 18 inch air gap. There was uh, anywhere from two to four layers of drywall. So like one side had four, the other, no, they, one side had three, the other side had two. The ceiling I think was three layers of drywall. So anyway, I measured on either side of that really good wall. Every other wall was actually a concrete foundation wall. So they, I mean, they were technically sound isolated too, but it didn't even matter. The HVAC system was isolated, you name it. So you could still hear sound on the other side of that wall, even with that high degree of isolation. Um, I had double doors. They were pretty thick. They were roughly 1.75 inch thick slab doors. They weren't sound isolation doors, but I did what I could with them. <clears throat> and uh, some of it was the doors. Some of it was the wall itself. I mean, some of it comes down to this. Um, when I was doing the testing, you would play sound at like 120 decibels and then you would measure it on both sides. So let's just say I did have uh, an STC of 65. Or let's say 60, make it easier for the math on this. Um, so 60, 120 minus 60 is still 60. 60 is above the noise floor of most rooms. That is audible. It doesn't take a lot of volume above noise floor to be readily audible. In fact, noise can be below the noise floor and still be audible. You can hear it and it can still be a nuisance. So you might say, well, you don't watch music or watch movies or listen to music at that volume level. That's true. And that's part of the sound isolation kind of myth, if you will. Um, so even so, if noise is even in the ballpark of the noise floor, it could be as much as about 10 decibels below the noise floor. 
you can still pretty readily hear that and it could be a nuisance. If you're sitting in just a very quiet room, think about it. Often you hear just the noise of air moving through your HVAC system or the vibrations of the motors. Um, a lot of people hear very, very quiet uh, dishwashers. And if you're trying to work, that might be a nuisance for you. My wife is pretty noise sensitive. So I will say, even after isolating this room uh, to a very, very high degree, you could still hear the explosions of movies. You could still sometimes hear loud shouting or bullets shooting from guns or whatever in these action movies in other parts of the house. But typically you had to be either directly over the theater or like right next to, like there was an area she had a desk set up that was right next to the partition wall between the theater and the playroom. Uh, she did. She actually had turned part of that playroom into an office for herself to work. Um, and so sound isolation, again, it's about reducing sound levels going through. But one thing to keep in mind is you can isolate them to a very, very high degree. You can actually dramatically improve things and you're still going to hear something on the other side. There is no such thing as soundproof. So that is the reason why people take issue with that term. Okay, so Noise floor, that is the other reason why people do this. Um, and in my mind, originally, it was always a both. It really never made sense to me that somebody would do it only for noise floor. But I've since had, I have a client right now and I've since had other clients who have been more focused on that than they were on not bothering other people. And some of it is that they there aren't other people to bother. And some of it is, it's just not a major concern for them. Um, I will say this. I think it should be a concern for all of you. Anybody who's building a theater, uh, and by this I mean is putting together a dedicated space that's fully enclosed for the purposes of watching movies with pretty good equipment that's capable of playing anywhere even in the ballpark of reference levels. And by that I mean even if, our, if we're talking peaks of 100 decibels, the typical transmission of sound through average uninsulated walls is only going to be reduced by somewhere between 5 and maybe 35 decibels. So if we're at 100 decibels for peaks, for instance, and remember, bass is going to be even louder and more of it will travel through. So at like mid-range frequencies, 100 decibels is probably still going to be a good 70, 75 decibels on the other side of a wall or the floor above or below. That's really loud still. Bass is going to be louder yet, typically, than the average levels of the mid-range. So let's just say that same 100 becomes 110 for those peaks. Well, 110 is going to be traveling through the walls. Even if we were able to get 30 decibels of isolation, it would be 80. But actually, you're not getting that much isolation. If you look at the transmission loss, of, and I've shown this in, in other videos I did, if you look at the transmission loss figures for walls, they, they isolate a lot less at low frequencies. So these kind of average walls are really only isolating maybe 10 or 15 decibels at most, maybe less. Let's just say it's 10. That 110 decibels now is 100 decibels. That's very loud. And while we're less sensitive to bass, which is why we don't care as much about it, that's still pretty loud. And, and so if you're in an otherwise quiet room and 100 decibels of bass frequencies are traveling through the room, that's very noticeable. And then you've got vibrations. So the same things we do to isolate sound help, um, and in some cases can be the same tricks to use to get rid of vibrations. But it, my wife's biggest complaint in the last theater, because it's hard to isolate a lot of vibrational energy that's happening physically to the, to the surfaces. So she had, the other place she tended to work was our dining room table. The dining room table was sitting on the floor in the room that was, it was our dining room, but it was directly above the theater. So you had the theater and then the next floor up, there was the dining room and the next floor up actually would have been our master bedroom. When she was sitting in the dining room working on the table or she used to have friends over sometimes and they would have, you know, drinks and, and tea and whatever and, and treats and they'd be sitting there and talking with each other and they'd all sit around the dining room table, especially in the winter when it was cold to go anywhere else. And she said what would happen is the table would vibrate like this. And she said it was really annoying and people would comment because they didn't know what was going on. They didn't realize there was this loud theater below them. And you couldn't really hear anything except for a little bit of the bass and all of those vibrations because the isolation between that big wall, like I said, was something like in the 70s. The isolation between those floors, because we're talking at that point, it was 24 inches of air gap because that's how big with the trusses plus all of the stuff that was done, the ceiling had to get dropped a little bit to go below some stuff. So we had, I think it was 22 to 24 inches of air gap 
and then you had the subfloor, and then we actually had replaced the flooring with, with wood, but before we put down the wood flooring, we put down an isolation mat and a new subfloor to flatten everything out, and it was a special isolation mat that both worked well for acoustics, but also helped to improve the leveling of the floor because it wasn't very good. And then there was another isolation mat, and then there was the wood itself. And um, so all of that, plus the fact that the ceiling below is three layers of, of green glued drywall, 5 8 type X. So that attached to isolators. And at the time I used Arsic clips with the hat channel. And then of course, acoustic insulation in there. All of that combined together leads to a lot of isolation. And so you really couldn't hear much of anything on that floor in terms of like voices. You could hear the bass if it was really, really loud. Mostly you couldn't, but what you could get, and what I never really did a great job of isolating, was the vibrations. And so it would shake the table, the floor was going up and down. I never, I didn't have the measurement equipment to do it, but I'd be curious what like a, a laser vibrometer or something like that would have come up with I, in terms of how much it moved up and down. But basically <clears throat> you need like a spring isolator to really isolate that, that ceiling enough to reduce those vibrations significantly at such low frequencies. And even a spring isolator isn't going to totally do it. I mean, it's, there's always going to be some transfer. So back on point, um, the, the, that was my reason for doing it. Noise floor wasn't. And so with noise floor, what happened was I, it made a big difference. It made the room was really quiet. Um, so the first thing that I figured out was I tried to measure noise floor using the typical methods and unlike so one of the ways that that trick I use for measuring sound isolation works is that it's using an FFT of a uh, sine sweep, and, and that method improves signal-to-noise ratio. And the longer the FFT length is, and the more um, sine sweeps you average, the better the signal-to-noise ratio of that measurement is. And each one of those methods actually improves it in different ways. So you're still going to have some limits from the microphone and noise floor but significantly less limits. You can measure way, way below the noise of either of those in that approach. And so what that allowed me to do was measure very high degrees of isolation because I could still measure the signal, that sign sweep, accurately, even if it was like 10 or 15 decibels below the noise floor of the microphone in room, possibly even 20 if it's in terms of room noise floor. Mic noise floor actually tends to be a bigger problem. So. I did have some issues with measuring it in the room, but not that many. Using the microphone I had, I had bought, which had a, a noise floor itself of around 20 dBA or so. I think it's rated for 17, but I think based on my measurements and what I'm seeing, that isn't really what I'm getting. So I think it's closer to 20, which is a pretty common number for that style capsule. Um, Upstairs, there actually was so much isolation, I had more issues. So then, anyway, back to the measuring in the room. I then tried to measure in the room. That trick, like I said, that works with an FFT. When you're measuring noise floor, though, itself, you're not measuring anything. You're just trying to measure the noise energy in the room. And so I took the microphone and I would take samples in different places and then average those samples. And what I realized rather quickly was by taking an average of noise over, let's say, 30 seconds or a minute in one location and another, never accumulated enough energy to exceed that of the microphone itself. So the first thing I realized was that the room's noise floor was below the noise floor of the microphone itself. So I couldn't measure it with that. Well, then I rented a microphone that had a lower noise floor, but the best you're ever going to get from that style of typical microphone, not, not special low noise microphones, but just typical half inch or one inch capsules, it's never going to be better than 10 or 12 dBA. And the one I got, I think, was somewhere between 12 and 15 dBA. But it was better in certain areas by a lot, and so that helped. And then I did the same thing, and I found that there were certain frequencies where the room clearly was having an effect. It wasn't the microphone noise. Most frequencies, we still seem to be at the microphone noise. So what I can say, whenever you see a, a, a dBA figure, let's say, of like 12 or 13, that's pretty close to an NC 12 or 13. So my, for the sake of argument, the room's noise floor was below NC 15. It was below, in fact, I believe NC 10, based on what I was seeing. But I never was able to get a microphone that was so quiet that I was sure I measured the room's noise floor. And I didn't even realize how true that was till more recently. So you may have heard me say numbers before, and I'm actually not 100% confident that those numbers were correct based on what I've since learned. <clears throat> 
The new room I have behind me also is very well isolated, even more so in some ways. The walls are not as thick, which doesn't help for isolation, but for noise floor, there's some things that were done. And I've got the same problem, although I'm gonna rent an even better microphone at some point to measure it just to show, but well, I'm curious, but also just to show how low you can go. Now, here's what happened. When that room got so quiet, my JVC projector, uh, it didn't matter which model. I had an RS1 originally, I later upgraded to, I'm gonna forget the correct model number, so I'm not even gonna say it. I think it was like a 540, but it was the second from top of the line at that time. Um, it was the one that was the faux 4K, you know, it, it uh, flashes a signal and then shifts it and flashes a signal and it gives you the perception of 4K sharpness. And um, that one was a little bit quieter than the RS1, but it was not in a hush box or anything. And the projector, it, it sounded like a jet engine, even though it was only about 20 to 25 dBA. The projector is pretty quiet. It's just that relative to the noise of the room, it was very loud. So to my point, what I learned was, as you make the room quieter, noises that were previously masked suddenly become audible and annoying. And uh, so that is one of the trade-offs of doing this sound isolation stuff is that the, as you isolate sounds in a multitude of ways and you make the room quieter, yes, you improve the dynamic range. Do keep in mind other things become annoying. At the extreme, in extremely low noise anechoic chambers where there's no reflections and there's no noises at all and you've got you know, noise floor levels that are somewhere between zero and even like, remember zero is the threshold of hearing. So zero and minus, let's say 45, 50 decibels where it's way, way, way below hearing, you can now hear things like body noises. And I don't mean like burping. <laughs> I mean body noises like your heart. You can actually hear the blood pumping through your veins because in your ears, there's nothing to drown it out. That's all you hear. And you do have, keep in mind, you do have uh, blood pumping through your ears. And so that noise is there in the background all the time. It's just drowned out by other things. Um, when there's no other noises to drown it out at all, you'll hear it. And it's noticeable and it's annoying to the point that it's uncomfortable. A lot of people don't like to stay around in those chambers because of that. It's, it's actually a fairly good reason not to make a theater too quiet is uh, you may start to run into those problems. Of course, you can make it really quiet and add some noise back in if you have to. So what is soundproofing? As I said, technically it's not a good term, but it just means making it so sound can't get in or out of the room. Keeping noise out of the room is about getting the noise floor down. Keeping noise in the room, so to speak, is about making it so that you don't bother other people. And I, as I said, I think that this is an underappreciated thing. It is pretty expensive to sound isolate a room. First off, it's a construction technique, and so you've got the cost of construction versus equipment. And when people are buying equipment, I, you know, I mentioned this before, I, I think you can put together a not great, but really decent theater system in terms of display, receiver, uh, maybe if needed amplifier, um, speaker. So just equipment, not acoustic stuff, not sound isolation, not chairs, just that stuff right there, probably in the neighborhood of $15,000 to maybe $20,000. That gets you into something that is not, not awful by any means, capable of halfway decent performance. Um, the sound isolation alone could easily cost that much. And also with the equipment, you just buy the equipment and set it up. And for a lot of people, that's something they can easily do themselves. For the sound isolation, it means tearing drywall down, doing some special building techniques, and then putting drywall back up and refinishing the space. If you rent, you're not doing that. And if you, even if you own, that's maybe more than you can get away with. And all of that assumes you actually have a space that can be sound isolated in some way. You know, what do you do if the space that you have can't be sound isolated because it's an open architecture, like a living room that opens to the kitchen, something like that, or family room that opens to the kitchen? There's no sound isolating that. In fact, at that point, if you're trying to sound isolate it, then you're going to have to figure out what you're sound isolating it to. You know, is it, is, are there, like in one space that I worked on, the, there was a family room. They wanted to be able to kind of party, if you will, in the, in the whole downstairs space. And the area above would have been all living space in terms of bedrooms, bathrooms. There was a you know, workout room, things like that. So the trick to that was you actually had to sound isolate the entire ceiling of the first floor. So the whole ceiling was built with two layers of 5 eighths drywall, sound, <coughs> excuse me, sound isolation clips, and insulation in the cavity, which you, of course, typically wouldn't do. 
Um, and then certain partition walls and, um, well, yeah, so then certain areas had to be blocked so sound couldn't get up and certain partition walls had to be sound isolated to help keep sound from getting up. And then the doors um, between the upstairs and the downstairs, there was two of them. So we didn't bother with sound rated doors, but we did do very thick, heavy doors with gaskets on the top and bottom. And that was not isolating sound within like a theater. That was just isolating the first floor from the second floor. So, you know, it's a tricky thing to get into doing that. So, so anyway, it's expensive, but it's way more expensive to do it after the fact than before. And I've had that happen even with integrators. So integrators sell the system. They probably, well, they may not have told the client that this is something to consider because they may not themselves know better, but let's just assume they did and they did mention it. Cause I'm working on right, one right now where the client was told, are you interested in it? And the client said, no, they built the theater. They set it up. The integrator and an interior designer and a carpenter all went in and did this beautiful theater. And the client is upset right now because they can't use that theater because it's too loud and no effort was taken to isolate it. There's a bedroom, one of the kids' bedrooms adjoins the theater on one side, another kid's bedroom adjoins the theater on another wall, below it is common living space and actually the master bedroom. And so what they're gonna have us do is go in and we will sound isolate that room. But what I've unfortunately had to tell him is all of that work was for nothing. We now have to take all of that interior finish out. Hopefully we can save some of it. We very likely cannot save all of it. And then we're gonna to have to go and do all that. So the, uh, the quote that I received so far to do this for the theater is about $120,000. I guarantee you, during the original construction, because some of those costs were incurred the first time around, during the original construction of the theater, had they been open to it, we could have done the same thing for about 15,000. So they're gonna spend about, I think it's like 120 plus thousand now to do something that would have been 15,000 then. So it's, it's just a, really a better idea to do it up front when you have an opportunity. And when you're at, at some degree of construction level, Tearing drywall out, insulating, putting some decoupling in, and putting drywall back in is not cheap, but it's not that bad compared to doing all sorts of fancy trim with wood and everything else and running all the wires and putting all your speakers in and all the equipment in and then having to rip all of it out, take it apart without ruining anything, ripping all the drywall out, putting the insulation in and then starting over. It's just, it's, it's definitely the better way to go. So I think that this is way underappreciated and I wish it was more considered. And, and I do feel like I'm frequently pounding my head against a wall trying to convince people of this when it should be pretty obvious. I mean, again, I know it's expensive, but you don't want a space you can't use. I think the assumption that it's always gonna be used with, as a family together is not necessarily true. These are pretty expensive spaces that you're, taking on and putting into a home. Um, and one of the things that was pointed out, so actually I'm hoping to have him on Audioholics probably the, in the future, but my um, realtor had, I had asked him about theaters and how common they are. And he said, you know, other than in really big high-end homes, they're very uncommon unless somebody like me just has a passion for it. You don't see it. And we were looking at new construction, but we actually, because you do save money, we were looking at track homes. And if I could have found a track home that was um, in our price point of the style we wanted with a theater as an option, which some of them had media rooms as options, I would have done that. And then I would have just asked them to build the, the walls the way I wanted them and, and design that. It would have been easier you know, than what we did, which was essentially custom designing a second floor to, uh, to the house and then building the house from scratch as a custom home. So one of the things that I found was that the home basically needed to be, at least in this general area, about a million to a million, million and a half, this is base price, before they even offered the option of the theater and then the theater was typically about a fifteen to $30,000 upgrade. Keep in mind, that was not equipment and that was not sound isolation. That was just to give you a room, period, nothing else. There was no wires run, there was no equipment and there was no sound isolation for that kind of money. And then as I said, the sound isolation piece of it, you need to, I would say in that scenario that I've just mentioned, you should assume it's gonna be another $10,000. That's gonna be the labor plus materials for the extra work, given that they're already building a room. And that doesn't then include 
running the wires, that doesn't include buying any equipment, that doesn't include acoustics, that doesn't include finishing the room in some sort of nice way that looks like a theater, etc. So it quickly put us out of budget to do a place like that. Plus the houses were bigger than we wanted. I didn't want a house that was more space than we actually needed. I don't like having unused rooms. So, um, you know, I, I get that it's expensive and what, what my uh, realtor, whose name is also Matt, told me was that they're expensive, but it's not just they're expensive to build. When you look at it as a value for the square footage, it's a lot of money tied up in a space that's has only one use, and for many people it doesn't get used very much. So there's a lot of people who actually build theaters, they only use it once a month. Um, they, or you know, some maybe are a little bit more into it, but they still only use it like on weekends, so that's really once a week, twice a week. Compare that to your kitchen, your bedrooms, your family room that you use multiple times a day every day. So there's very few spaces that people have in their house that they would only use once a week. So when you think about it from that standpoint, in my area, new houses at least, would typically have a value of around $700 a square foot. So let's just use that number. So $700 a square foot, and the theater, my theater is 16 by 19.5, uh, although some of that's wall space, but yeah, actually we need to do it the correct way. So it's 16 point, no, it's 17, that's right. So Okay, so it's 17 times, 21. That's the space, if you will, that we had in terms of outside walls to then build a theater inside of. So that's the square footage that matters. Times 700. So that's $250,000 in value in that theater alone. So that's a lot of money. It's not adding $250,000 in value to the house though. And that's because in this price point of houses, People just don't care that much about theaters. That would have to be a bedroom and a bathroom to even add half that value onto the house, let alone all that value. It would have to be finished really nicely to add all that value. The, it, it actually may be adding, I think, to the value of the house based on what he told me, somewhere between nothing, even though the space is there. In other words, it's like square footage. You have to pull off the house to get the correct value of it to maybe... 60 or $70,000. So $250,000 of square footage value only giving actually maybe 60 or $70,000. And this is true of anybody's house um, uh, up until a very, very high dollar, let's say three to $5 million plus homes. Anything below that, theaters typically are hurting the value of the house, unfortunately. I, I do think if you can do them, in, in our last house, it actually helped because it was sort of a selling point, but there's, I think there's a very fair argument to be made that it added nothing. It just was, it just was fun. You know, people walked in and they're like, that's cool. Um, we got more for the house than we expected, but the value of houses were skyrocketing at the time. So I think that's really what drove it up. For most people, it's gonna probably hurt the value of the house because it is this dedicated single use space. Um, but yeah, anyway, th the thing you gotta think about is what is the value of that space and how much more valuable is it if you can use it more? to you and potentially to, sell, to a buyers if you were to sell it. And I, I, that, in that context, I think the sound isolation is worth it. It's very unlikely that you would have spent that $700 a square foot to build the space. You probably were spending more like somewhere between 150 and 250, um, maybe 350 to 400 if you're doing high-end finishes. And so the extra $25 or $50 a square foot that it costs to do the sound isolation becomes worth it in that context. And that's what I think you have to think about if you're gonna do this. So this was an overly long video explaining sound isolation, what it is and why I think you should do it, but hopefully it was helpful. Thank you. Oh, subscribe to my videos, by the way, so you can stay on top of everything I'm doing.